Hi, I'm Chad, and welcome to Virtual Reality. I like to start some of my vlogs in Virtual Reality because it is a place where we can go fast. So without further ado, let us go fast. Back to reality. So, I have owned my 2017 Aprilia 210 V4 1100 factory for over a year now. It was one year on January 23rd. I've put about 4,900 miles on this bike. I've had it on track four times. And I've overall just really, really enjoyed owning this motorcycle. It truly is something special if you ask me. Being that it's been a whole year, I thought it only appropriate to do a review and tell you what it's like to own a Tuono V4 factory over the course of a year. And I'm going to do just that in this video and a little bit more. So first, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the Aprilia Tuono V4 in case you're not familiar with it. After that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've noticed with the bike, just little nuances as to what it's like to sit on and handle. Then I'm going to tell you about what it's like to ride on the street, and then I'll tell you what it's like to ride on track. We'll stop, I'll walk around the bike, tell you a little bit about the modifications that I have made, and we'll round the video up by talking about reliability, whether or not I would recommend this motorcycle, and who I would recommend it to. So let's get started. So in 2009, Aprilia debuted the 2V World Superbike Championship winning RSV4 with a 1000cc 65 degree V4 and stunning Italian looks. It was an instant hit. Its versatile power band and amazing geometry and suspension led Max Biaggi to win the World Superbike Championship in 2010 and again in 2012. Now in 2012, Aprilia introduced the Street Fighter RSV4, which they named the Tuono V4. With the engine tuned down just a little bit to make it more usable on the street. Look at all those Amazon trucks, interesting. And slightly different chassis geometry. The Tuono V4 was again, kind of an instant success. There were a few reports of engine failures and things of that nature, but being a boutique Italian brand in the early 2010s, who can really be all that surprised? But I think on the whole, it was a pretty good motorcycle and it's pretty revered and highly regarded. So in 2015 in some parts of the world and 2016 in others, like North America, Aprilia facelifted the Tuono V4, giving it the nice RSV4 style front fairing and introducing a factory model with Olin suspension and the tail section off of the RSV4, which in my opinion is a lot prettier than the large passenger seat, which still isn't too bad looking. That comes on the standard version of the Tuono V4 or the Tuono V4 RR. This facelift in 2015 slash 16 also saw the introduction of an 1100, or actually 1077cc, 65 degree V4. Producing 173 or 175, based on where you read horsepower, and 89 and a half foot pounds of torque, as opposed to the 159 horsepower and I believe 82 or 83 foot pounds of torque that the 1000 cc V4 in the original 200 V4 produced. So more power, more torque, sexier styling, good stuff. In 2017, the bike was again updated with new electronics. So you still have eight levels of traction control, three levels of wheelie control, but you now have cornering ABS with three levels, launch control with three levels, a pit lane limiter, cruise control, the beautiful TFT dash, and a quick shifter and auto blipper. Whereas before the Tuono only had a quick shifter for gear shifts up. And then of course, last year in 2021, we received the newest Tuono V4, the 2021 which is completely restyled, 
has some chassis improvements but still uses the same engine and I understand there are some electronics improvements as well. So a couple things about just the position you ride in on this motorcycle and keep in mind I'm a big boy I'm six foot three and I've got some legs on me so this might not bear true for you. The handlebar well much higher than clip-ons you still are pitched a little bit forward in your upper body it's not a very aggressive lean if you just got your arms loose like I do just a slight angle but you do lean a little bit forward you're not sitting totally straight up like you might on perhaps a Yamaha MT-10 your lower body is very tight very aggressively positioned now I'm used to this having ridden super sport bikes basically my entire bike life so it wasn't very different for me hopping onto this bike but for a naked bike it is a pretty aggressive lower body position. The pegs are high, they're a bit far back. Your legs are pretty tucked up here, up against the tank. The seat's actually quite comfortable for the kind of motorcycle that this is. Definitely the most comfortable sport bike seat I've ever ridden on. And something else too, the fuel tank. It's this very low profile, sexy looking gas tank with these very sharp edges. And my legs are so long that if I were to go to set up for body position, my leg is hooked right onto the edge. Now I have tank grips on this bike, and those do help a bit because my race suit, especially at the racetrack, will still make contact with the tank grip. But it was something different and something I had to get used to, being used to my Daytona 675Rs, very tall gas tank, a lot of surface area there for me to hook my leg on that was flat. But it's still easy to get hooked onto the tank and feel very stable in the seat while cornering. The windscreen, well it does help if you are completely tucked, like chin to tank tucked, like you would be at the racetrack trying to set a lap time. Outside of that, doesn't really do much. That said, if you do have an aerodynamic sport bike helmet, you can kind of just lean into the wind and that pitch forward actually helps. You can kind of just support yourself on the wind resistance a little bit. Not too much buffeting going on on your head, but it's there and I think it looks cool. So what's it like to ride on the street? Well, the factory, being that it is more track oriented with a very firm Olin suspension that I have set up for myself, it's not the most comfortable bike in the world, but we don't buy bikes like this for comfort. We buy them for excitement and for performance. And this bike offers both. It's not the firmest suspension I've ever ridden on the street, but it's certainly far from the softest. If you're looking at a 210 V4 and you're thinking you're most likely going to be riding it on the street most of the time, the RR would probably be a better option for you. Unless you are willing to put up with this like I am for the sake of the beautiful Super Bowl graphic and RSV4 rocket tail. That said though, the riding position is pretty good for street riding. Again, you sit fairly upright, but not completely upright, but very easy to keep weight off of your wrists. And unless you're just blowing through wind on the highway for hours and hours at a time, it's reasonably comfortable. Certainly much better than any sport bike with clip-ons and full fairings that I have ever ridden. Now I've had it on some canyon roads, more aggressive than this, but haven't really pushed it too hard. But I have had it on the racetrack again four times. Most recently on the set of Pirelli Super Corsa TDs that I am running today. So these tires are, I would say, a step above the standard Super Corsa V2s that came on this bike from the factory. And I have no experience riding on those tires, but these are amazing. On the track, the bike is a blast to ride. Now obviously it's at a horsepower disadvantage compared to any true superbike. So you're gonna get walked on the straights. For what it lacks in horsepower, it makes up for in agility and handling. This is probably the most fantastic chassis I've ever ridden in my life. Now given I'm no professional motorcycle journalist or a professional racer or anything, I do have a lot of track day experience and some club racing experience. And this bike feels fantastic. The brakes are amazing. The bike steers in so nice, especially as you're trail braking through a corner. There's a lot of grip on corner exit, especially on these Super Corsa TDs. I was riding Rosso 3s before and those didn't have the best rear grip, but they worked. You just had to turn the traction control up a little bit. Also another note, 
APRC settings. I do generally run the same APRC settings on the street as I do at the track with the exception of ABS because if you turn ABS to one or off, you lose the cornering assist functionality as well as the rear lift mitigation. So generally speaking, and ABS I have set to one right now, but usually I leave it on two so that I have rear lift mitigation and cornering ABS on just for some extra safety on the street. But I run traction control on two, with the control is off, launch control is on too, even though I think I've only used that feature like twice. And I think the only difference between the launch control settings is the rev limit that it'll hold the bike at when you're preparing to launch. But the bike is an absolute joy to ride on track. It's the only place where you can really use everything that this bike has got. And especially with my SC Project CRT exhaust, it is just like nothing else to be coming out of a corner, picking the bike up and rolling on the throttle, especially when you're up high enough that you can just really rip it really make that v4 roar but i have to say my favorite feature on the track is the auto blipper it is so nice to be able to just grab the brake not have to worry about using the clutch and just click the shifter and have it blip your downshifts perfectly before i had my first 20 which was an rr that i owned for about 10 months before i sold it because i bought this bike i had never even had a slipper clutch on a bike so i was used to having to use the brake and rev match my downshifts on my own and oh man it makes it so much easier to just focus on your brake markers you can focus more on where you're going and especially when the front suspension is loaded up all the way on the brakes and you're downshifting at high rpm the auto blipper is seamless it's truly incredible this bike does also have a slipper clutch so that'll help take up any of the rotational difference in transmission engine versus wheel speed but again with the front suspension loaded and not much load on the rear wheel that slipper clutch will really take up any inconsistencies and give you absolutely perfect downshifts all right so let's get to the taboo part of the conversation and that is reliability now obviously i can only speak from my own experience but this bike has been very reliable i would say on the whole it started every time, it's never left me stranded anywhere. It's done basically what I've expected it to do, which is great. It's not bad from a maintenance standpoint either, just your standard motorcycle maintenance. You know, I change my oil about every 3,000 miles or less, depending on how much track time the bike sees. If it does go to the racetrack for a day and I put 100 miles on it on track, I'll count that as a thousand street miles. So if I do one full track day, I'll change the oil at 2,100 miles and so on. Chain maintenance is basic. Did that have noticed, especially in going to the racetrack, it goes through front brakes a little bit faster than other bikes I've owned, but that makes sense because it's a heavier bike and it's generally braking at the track at higher speeds. So, physics. Valve adjustments are every 12,500 miles or 6,250 if you race the bike, but it's not really a race bike. And although I do track it sometimes, I think I'll probably be due for a service at 12.5. And if my valves are out of spec, they won't be out of spec for too long by then. Now, as far as issues go, I've only really had two issues with this bike and they're pretty minor in the grand scheme of things, I think. First issue, there are breather holes on the cylinder block for, I believe, the spark plug. It's kind of interesting and not something that I have seen on other motorcycles that I have owned before. But anyways, you have your valve cover gasket that creates a seal on the valve cover so as not to let oil, one, come out of the valve cover through the spark plug holes and not down into the spark plug wells. Now there are also O-rings where the cam retainers bolt to the cylinder head to secure the camshafts. And it's not uncommon for those O-rings and also the gasket part of the valve cover gasket on the spark plug well to start leaking over time after they've been heat cycled a lot. And I've noticed mine weep a little bit. I had oil run out of that little breather hole one time. So after that, I took a Q-tip, stuck it in there, let it sit for about an hour and soak up the oil. Took it out, flipped it around, put it back in, and it was totally dry. So. I don't really want to tear that far into this bike when I only have a, about another 2,000 miles until I'm due for my valve service anyways. So this only started happening recently and I've just made sticking a Q-tip in there part of my regular chain maintenance. So every time I clean, lube, and adjust the chain, 
or check tension on it, I'll just stick a Q-tip in there while I do that. Let it soak up the little bit of oil that's in there. It's never been much. Yeah, just enough to make the cotton swab end the color of the oil. But obviously we'll address that along with my valve service. And since it's in a low pressure spot of the engine where there isn't really oil pressure or it's not trying to lubricate anything right there, I really don't think that it's an issue. Ooh, windy right there. But it hasn't been weeping enough to even have an impact on the amount of oil. I check my oil on this bike every time I clean and lube the chain as well. And I've only had to top it off, I think, twice in the entire time that I've owned it. And both of those were shortly after track days. So pretty good. Doesn't really burn much oil. But the other thing that started happening recently, I'm not sure if it has to do with just the Aprilia Performance ride control system or if it's the auto blipper, which is what I've been led to believe online. But in this really weird circumstance where I go and do a first gear power wheelie and use the rear brake, and then bang it through the gears at low RPM really quick and set my cruise control, the bike will feel like it's trying to cut the ignition, like it's trying to shift up gears. And I'll get the APRC warning lights flashing on the dash, so kind of weird, not really sure why that happens, but it only happens when I do exactly that. So if I turn my cruise control off or my traction control off, it hasn't been an issue, but we will see. Perhaps long term, I'll look at replacing that sensor. Aside from having to remove the tank to get to the connector, it should be pretty simple to swap out. But again, on the whole, it still works as you've seen throughout this entire video. Haven't had that weird situation happen once. Knock on wood, because I'm not done yet. But on the whole, it's been very reliable, I would say. More so than I think I initially expected from a boutique Italian motorcycle, especially of the exotic variety. Well, let's pull over for just a second and take a look at the bike so I can show you what it looks like and what I've done to it in terms of modifications. All right, here she is, my 2017 Aprilia 210 V4 1100 factory. So what's different about this bike? First and most obvious on the video probably, SC Project CRT exhaust. Previous owner installed that, as well as the Aprilia Race ECU and this Fender Eliminator kit with LED turn signals. Now, as far as what I've changed on the bike, the suspension, full Olin suspension front and rear, that is stock, but I have had it set up for myself. So sag, compression, rebound, all that good stuff set up for me. Also, something else I neglected to mention, this bike has an Olin steering damper stock that is adjustable. I have it maxed out on the firmest setting that you can get. So Olin suspension, RSV4 tail, super pole graphic, and the Olin steering damper are what separate this bike from the Tuono V4RR. Now I've changed the brake pads, they're Ferrodos, they're, I forget the model number, but they're the equivalent of the OEM pad, but it's supposed to last a little bit longer. Most recently, I added these. They are the New Rage Cycles or NRC slim turn signals. Very pretty LED, look great, much better than the stock ones, and I think make this bike look a lot more modern and timeless. Got the CRG Aero bar end mirrors mounted on Rhino Moto bar end sliders with mirror mounts specifically for those mirrors. Also changed the grips out to Renthal's Superbike Grips Soft Compound and flushed the brake fluid. So we have a Motul RBF 600 high temp racing brake fluid. I also removed the EVAP canister as I was getting all the crazy pressure buildup in the tank and it would spit gas everywhere every time I would open it to put fuel in and just make it really hard to put fuel in it. Last couple things, I've got this. This is the Woodcraft GP shift lever. So just relocates the shift linkage up top so that you have reverse shift or GP shift instead of standard. So it's one up, five down, as opposed to one down, five up and still works with the factory quick shifter and auto blipper. So very nice touch there. Again, I'm on the Pirelli Super Corsa TDs right now. So SC2 front, SC3 rear, basically like a more medium compound and a harder compound on the rear. And then I just have this drop peg that I got from AF1 Racing. It's a Woodcraft peg and then they custom make this part so that it can angle the brake pedal lower. Being I'm a big guy, I have big feet. So helps to make me more comfortable using the rear brake as well. But yeah, there she is. Other than that, she is bone stock. Just been doing the regular maintenance and she's been treating me well.
back to reality. So, final thoughts on the 27 Heater Pro Utono V4 1100 factory. I have absolutely loved this motorcycle and just about every moment that I have been able to share with it. So that said, despite having all these electronic rider aids, which are helpful and will certainly help you not crash, they're not the type of aids that'll help you go faster. It's kind of my only critique on them. I've had like traction control, for example, intervene on track before, and it definitely slows you down a little bit on corner exit, but not too much. It's not like it's aggressively cutting the power and putting you in a point where you think you might crash, but definitely not helpful like I know the Yamaha R1's traction and slide control are, for example. But on the whole, this is a fantastic motorcycle. It's got so much soul and is just so much fun to ride, no matter what kind of riding you're doing on it. I always feel like a rock star on this motorcycle, and I would highly recommend it to an experienced rider. That said, again, it's got a bunch of electronic rider aids. It also has multiple engine maps, but they all give you access to full power, and you can get into a situation where you are going very, very, very fast, much faster than you would really expect to be going, especially if you're coming from a 600 or something like that, in very little time. So if you've been riding for a while, even if you have been on a 600, you could look at this bike. That's what I did. I came to this from a Daytona 675R, which I still have and turned into a race bike. But I would recommend proceeding with caution and leaving all of the electronic rider aids on a high setting, at least while you start out. Like traction control probably on like five or six, wheelie control at least on one, if not two or three, ABS on two, it'll be good for you. And if you're a beginner, I wouldn't even think about this. Maybe down the road. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this one up. So thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed, be sure to give this video a gentle little click of the like button. Consider subscribing for more 210v4 and motorcycling content. And drop a comment below. Have any of my other videos helped you buy a 210v4 or decide to buy a 210v4? Also, I'm coming up to my 12,500 mile valve service, which I kind of don't want to do myself because I know it's going to take a long time. But I'll tell you what, if I get to 10,000 subscribers by the time I reach 12,500 miles on this bike, which I estimate will be in April or May, I'll do it myself and I'll document the entire process for each of you to watch as reference. So with that, thanks again for watching, and I will hope to catch you in the next one. Until then, later.